and in today's session we will be looking at classical criticism as well as english criticism up to the victorian age this is a one hour session and it is quite difficult to cover all the uh, you know areas but still i'll try to do a roller coaster right and uh, i hope with the help of this powerpoint presentation you can also join in this right so shall we begin the word criticism is derived from this greek root word which means to judge at later comes the term kritikos which means judge of literature and even also peter this is his definition of criticism criticism is the art of interpreting it is the art of interpretation and in today's session we will be looking at classical criticism as well as english criticism up to the victorian age so classical criticism we know begins with none other than plato plato who has got you know many diverse even contradictory views about the very nature of literature so if you look at the different concepts of plato the philosopher turned poet could you move to the next slide matilda plato's concepts or plato's general ideas about literature mainly centers around these ideas his theory of ideas mimesis function of poetry plato's attack on poetry and plato's views on drama and these concepts we find in his seminal work that is the republic The Republic is a seminal work of Plato, along with the other works like Symposium, Dialogue, The Laws, Apology, and Plato. These are the other major works of Plato. And our concepts of theory of ideas, mimesis, poetry, and drama—all these we can see in the work The Republic. And we'll begin with Plato's theory of ideas, because everything begins there with ideas. And according to Plato, things are conceived as ideas before they attain concrete shape. And the concrete object is actually the second stage of it. You can see this: the very form of beauty that is an idea, that is an abstract concept. It is from this abstract concept we derive a concrete object, which is the second stage. And what is art doing? art is imitating this so this is plato's first idea about this theory of idea that is artist tries remote from reality or art is totally unreal and from this theory of idea he goes on defining what is poetry according to plato poetry is an art form hence it is also an art of imitation it is an imitation of reality and poetry this is also twice removed from reality and also plato we know that banished poets from his work the republic and there were two grounds two reasons why he banished poets from the republic first one was that poetry is useless for society or the you know it doesn't have any practical or utilitarian purpose second was that poetry is immoral because it arouses baser human instincts poetry appeals to emotion rather than the intellect so it is on these grounds plato banished poets from the republic and all these ideas all these concepts of unreal imitation is centered around this one word which is mimesis mimesis is a greek word which means imitation 
But for Plato, as well as his disciple Aristotle, Mimes is not just imitation. It is representation rather than copying. This is a word that they use. Mimesis is representation of nature. There is also another word related to this which is very similitude. V-E-R-I-S-I-M-I-L-I-T-U-D. Very similitude. So imitation is the base with which art is created. Or art, according to Plato, is an imitation in the world of ideas. And he sees art as nothing but shadowy representations of this ideal type, which is twice remote from reality. But Beres is a disciple, Aristotle, he actually differed in this view with, with Plato. He agrees that Mimesis is representation of nature, but it is not imitation of idea, but it is imitation of an action. It is something which reflects the reality. So the approach of these two people, the master disciple duo, is different with regard to the concept of mimesis. For Plato, mimesis is ethical and political, whereas for Aristotle, it is aesthetic. Now moving on to uh, Plato's view on drama. Drama is again art, and according to uh, Plato, drama is again twice remote from reality. Drama also appeals to emotion rather than intellect. Drama is immoral. It deviates human beings. By watching tragedies, spectators may try to imitate the character. This is what he says. And by watching comedies, spectators may lose their seriousness. So in no way, Plato approved of drama. And these are the important uh, concepts of ideas. There's a definition of poetry. On drama. And most importantly, Nemesis and Plato's attack on poetry. Why he banished poets or poetry. Politics and point oh. uh, where he discusses the most important artistics of a tragic hero, differences between tragedy and epic, and all since. Then, poetics. Aristotle has these works, metaphysics, politics, the anime, categories, and ethics. These are the other important works of Aristotle. Now, let us focus on and the most important counter Aristotle is an art of imitation. But as we have already mentioned, it is something which is complete in self something which is expressed in ornaments alone, embellished language which is dramatic, not narrative, as in the case of epics, with incidents. This is the most important part of Aristotle's definition of tragedy. It has got incidents which arose pity and fear, thereby accomplishing catharsis of these emotions. It has incidents arousing pity and fear, which helps in the accomplishment of catharsis. So what is catharsis? Catharsis, the very word, it is a Greek word which means purification or purgation of emotions. And Aristotle sees catharsis as an intellectual clarification or it is an insight experience where the purification of mind takes place. And catharsis is something that has got a therapeutic effect on the audience. So when we discuss the tragic hero of Aristotle, this is what Aristotle says about his tragic hero. The tragic hero must be neither a villain nor a virtuous man. But he should be a character between these two extremes. He shouldn't be so good, so just. At the same time, he shouldn't be 
too villainous a person. A literary character who makes an error in judgment, which eventually leads to his own destruction. That is Aristotle's tragic hero. And you can see that these six important elements, or these are the six features, six characteristics of an Aristotelian tragic hero. Hamertia, Peripetia, Catharsis, Anagnorisis, Mimesis, and Chopris. It is not Mimesis, sorry, it is Mimesis, M-E-M-E-S-I-S. -E -E so let's begin with Hamertia. Hamertia, again, all these are Greek words. Hamertia, we know the meaning of the word is tragic flow. That particular flow in the hero's character, which leads to his downfall. And Hamertia can even called as an error of judgment. With the help of all the major Shakespearean tragedies, we can explain Hamertia. King Lear was a megalomaniac king, which led to his downfall. Macbeth, he had vaulting ambition. Hamlet, we say it is the uh, procrastination. The doubtful nature of Oedipus. All these are tragic flows of these Shakespearean tragic heroes, which led to not just their downfall, but the downfall of their entire nation or their tribe or their community. So Hamasya is something which we see in almost all the tragic heroes. And Catharsis, we have already explained what happens towards the end. Second one is hubris. Hubris is excessive pride or the fact of being too proud, which is there in almost all the tragic heroes. And as I you know, explain to you these features of the tragic heroes, just think of those Shakespearean tragic heroes. That would be Othello, Hamlet, Macbeth. King Lear, just keep on thinking about these characters and you will get the very idea behind these these terms. Excessive pride. It could be the pride of Macbeth, pride of King Lear. And the third, you know, aspect is peripetia. Peripetia is a reversal of fortune. Hello. Then comes anagnorisis. Anagnorisis is that one particular moment when the hero makes an important discovery in the story and ignorances the moment happens when the hero makes an important discovery in the story uh whoever is playing the slide please you're going so fast we are behind please i think could you go back to the the other slide the previous one. Previous one, please. Yeah, thank you. So an is at that moment when the hero makes an important discovery in his, you know, uh, in the story. Maybe of Manput, the prophecy made by the witches that he would be the king of Scotland. So that one moment where he makes this discovery. Then comes Mimesis. Mimesis is a fortune that the protagonist cannot avoid. It is because of maybe fate or many other reasons. This one incident he has to undergo. That is Mimesis. Then Catharsis. The feelings of pity and fear, which both the audience feels at the same time the protagonist. So if all these characteristics are there, in the hero, we can call that hero as Aristotelian tragic hero. Though the modern dramatists, they have totally deviated from this particular, you know, definition of Aristotle's tragic hero, but still, uh, the Elizabethan dramatists, especially Shakespeare, and if we take Marlowe again, we can see the tragic heroes with these features. Yeah. So that was the second um, contribution of uh, Aristotle with regard to tragic hero. Moving on to the next one. Yeah, I think we can move this. We have already discussed uh, this particular part. Between epic and tragedy. There are some certain similarities between epic and tragedy according to Aristotle. 
both you know imitate action imitation of a serious action it is complete both have you know plots both simple as well as complex plots follows the unity of action and just like drama has you know six elements epic has four elements plot character thought diction the fate of this story depends on the action of the hero these are certain common things certain similarities between epic and tragedy but at the same time there are many differences if we take epic we can see a hero of universal significance but in a tragedy it is a tragic hero with hamartia or tragic flow in epic there is a celebration of the hero the hero is celebrated or he is you know elevated to such an extent that we worship even the the readers they worship the audience they worship him but in tragedy the hero undergoes catharsis the superhuman status of the epic hero whereas in tragedy this is the aristotelian tragic hero he should be a person of noble birth should be of noble character and aristotle has you know introduced a greek term for that which is spodeus s p o u d a i o s spodeus which means noble again with regard to the you know um story in epic it is narration whereas in tragedy it is action epic is lengthy tragedy is very compact epic will have several major events but in tragedy there will be only one major event with several other minor events the time limit of tragedy only one event at one specific time tragedy should stick to the unity of time whereas in epic simultaneous events there is no restriction of time at all and in epic we can find many improbabilities many things which we may find very difficult to understand that is the improbabilities there and in tragedy the mode of imitation is higher there is more concentration of thought as well as action so these are the differences between epic and tragedy so epic if we look at just two works we can see that epic imitates life by narration while tragedy by action length is limited in tragedy but not in epic and aristotle a imitation plus higher and tragedy appeals to a refined audience not everyone goes and watch tragedies it appeals or legion of thought and action in tragedy and hence he finds tragedy superior to epic i guess that's clear aristotle's view on epic and tragedy can we move to the next slide please hello yes so the it is something that we are familiar with the three unities according to aristotle tragedy should follow the unity of time unity of place as well as unity of action and there is also a plot structure to tragedy the there are five acts the first act is known as the exposition act 2 is the rising action act 3 climax act 4 is falling action and act 5 is the denouement let's see try and guess uh the ideas or the contribute now we'll move to another classic that is horace horace was a contemporary of the great roman poets like virgil and homer he was also a friend of the emperor augustus and horace was a more practically oriented critic whereas plato was more philosophical as well as aristotle both were quite philosophical where horace was practically oriented and he was well versed in the new uh, poetic forms and he considered the ancient greek poets as true poetic models and these are some of the things that horace 
mentions in his work Ars Poetica. A R S P O E T I C A. Ars Poetica. Ars Poetica is a work which is addressed to his patron El Piso. Ars Poetica is also known as Epistle to the to the Pisos. That was the first title given to Ars Poetica, Epistle to the Pisos. So the Ars Poetica, this work of Horace, is a versified epistle. Epistle, you know, is a letter. So it's a letter in the form of verse, and this is seen as a guide to literary composition, where he talks about the very content of poetry, style of poetry, and it's also got a discussion on poets. In this particular work, Horace also talks about decorum. What is poetic decorum? Decorum, according to um, Horace, is the use of apt vocabulary and diction. So he strictly wanted the poets to follow poetic decorum, or he gave much emphasis to the importance of decorum in poetry. So with that, we'll move to uh, Longinus, another classic critic. Longinus is known as the first romantic critic. And he was known as a romantic critic because he was a person who lived during the classical age under the influence of the classical writers. But in his writings, we could see romantic traits. So he's known as the first romantic critic. And Longinus is known for this one work, which is On the Sublime. On the Sublime is a work where he talks about sublimity as the greatness of a work. This work is addressed to uh, a Roman public figure by name Terentianus. And this is uh, ju just a fragment we see of On the Sublime. It is again in epistolary form. And the final part of uh, this particular work actually deals with public speaking. And the majority of this particular uh, part is lost, actually. So the first part of the work on the sublime talks about sublimity. Sublimity is excellence in language. Or sublimity is defined as loftiness in theme and treatment. Loftiness or no noble greatness. And he defines sublimity as the echo of the greatness of spirit. It is the echo of the greatness of spirit. The elevated theme, the elevated expression, or according to Lord Chinese, is the quality of the works of great writers, which something which actually makes a work immortal. It is sublimity which makes a work immortal. And he talks about two kinds of sublimity. True sublimity and false sublimity. True sublime, according to Lord Jainas, is lofty ideas conceived in lofty language. Something which lifts the soul of the reader as well as the writer. And true sublime pleases all and pleases always. And it is this true sublime which he uh, you know, defines as the echo of greatness of soul. At the same time, there is something called false sublime. False sublime is the use of bombastic language with empty matter. The affected pompous language which is used to clothe thoughts which are essentially trivial. They won't be anything inside. But just a bombastic, pompous kind of a language will be used in false sublime. And Longinus votes for true sublimity. And for true sublimity, the best example is Milton. John Milton's grand style is the best example of sublimity. And Longinus also talks about the very you know, sources of sublimity. Five various sources, according to Longinus, of sublimity are great thought, strong emotions, figures of speech. Not all figures of speech. He is, he is talking about certain figures of speech like epic similes or the heroic similes that we see in epic uh, works. We also find epic similes in the works of Milton, Paradise Lost. So use of certain figures of speech, then the noble diction and defined, sorry, dignified 
word arrangement. These, according to Longinus, are the sources of sublimity. So along with sources of sublimity, he also talk, talks about impediments to sublimity. What are the impediments? The obstacles to sublimity. Three things, tumidity, puerility, and parenthesis. Tumidity is affectation. We are quite familiar with tumidity. Affectation is something uh, that we see in certain writings. Where the writer makes a very flawed endeavor by using unwanted, overblown language. The affected language which is used by writers, that is tumidity. Second one is puerility or pedantry. Just to show off the pedantry, maybe the, the actual content is very, very trivial sometimes. And the third one is parenthesis, which is sentimentality that is very false, more empty, out of place. So these are three aspects which writers who aspire for sublimity should avoid according to Longinus. So Longinus as a critic should be remembered for this work on the sublime and the concepts related to sublimity. True sublime, false sublime, different sources of sublimity and the impediments to sublimity. So with Plato, Aristotle, Horis and Longinus, we have covered classical criticism. Now we are going to move to Renaissance criticism with Sir Philip Sidney. Sidney, we are familiar with Sidney as a writer, a contemporary of William Shakespeare, one of the finest poets of Elizabethan era, who also has contributed to literary criticism, English literary criticism, and the work is Apology for Poetry. We are very familiar with this particular work of Sidney, Apology for Poetry. Apology for Poetry was actually published in two editions by two different people. The first edition was titled The Defense of Poesy, and the second was titled An Apology for Poetry. And remember, Sidney wrote Apology for Poetry as a reply to Stephen Gozen. Stephen Gozen wrote the work School of Abuse, where he called poets as jesters, players, and caterpillars of Commonwealth. So Sidney gave a very fitting reply to Gozen with his Apology for Poetry. So for Sidney, poetry is a speaking picture. The very aim of poetry is to teach and to delight. And in Apology for Poetry, he talks about various divisions of poetry or the different genres that has emerged during the Renaissance time in poetry, like the religious, the philosophical, the real poetry, pastoral, elegiac, satire, comedy, tragedy, lyric, and epic. These are the various kinds of poetry that the, or the divisions of poetry that he mentions in Apology for Poetry. Now, let's look at the attack by Gosen and Sidney's reply to each of uh, statements made by Gosen. You can uh, check the title of the entire work of Gosen, School of Abuse. That is actually a pamphlet, School of Abuse. The title of School of Abuse, the full title was School of Abuse containing a pleasant invective against poets, pipers, players, jesters, and such like caterpillars of the corporate wealth. So we call poets as pipers and jesters, simply caterpillars of the commonwealth. And these were the four important accusations Gozen had against poets and poetry. Number one was that it is a waste of time. Second, it is the mother of lies. Third, it is a nurse of abuse. It had a corrupting influence on people. Fourth, Plato banished poets from the Republic. To which Sidney gave very fitting reply. For the first one, poetry as a waste of time. He says, poetry is conducive to virtuous action. Poetry leads to virtuous actions. As mother of lies, poetry offers not fact but fiction. Therefore, poetry affirms nothing. It never lies. Poetry as a nurse of abuse. And the reply that Sidney gave was, the fault lies not with poetry, but with the contemporary abuse of poetry. And again, for the last one, that Plato banished poets from the Republic, he said, Plato himself was a poet, and a large part of his work, dialogic, is poet. 
tick. So these are the, uh, you know, the replies that Sidney gave to Stephen Gosen in his apology for poetry. Now, uh, Sidney also justifies verse and rhyme in the apology for poetry because according to Gosen, poetry is nothing but rhyming and versifying for which Sidney answered that rhyme is not the essence of poetry but rhyme is a desirable element and he gives reasons also. It is polished to speech, it regulates verbal harmony, it adds quality to music, it is also an aid to memory. So rhyme is not the essence but it is desirable due to these reasons according to Sydney. And uh, this is Sydney's definition of poetry which we find in Apology for Poetry that poetry was the first light giver to ignorance and first nurse. And uh, the entire work is divided into seven divisions. Broadly, these are the seven divisions of Apology for Poetry that we find in the text. Not going to dwell deep into the uh, seven divisions. Um, we are, I think, even now running short of time. I'll move to the next part, which is neoclassical criticism. And we have two neoclassical critics, two great critics, Dryden and Poe. So neoclassical critics, they, uh, we know uh, the very uh, rules they followed. The very term neoclassical comes from their adherence to the classical writers and their rules. So for them, the very aim of poetry is to teach, is to instruct. They followed all the rules of the classical masters. They gave too much importance to heroic couplet and also poetic decorum. So first we look into John Dryden. Dryden uh, is known for many poetical and prose works and when it comes to criticism, these are the three important works of Dryden. Of Essay of Dramatic Poesy, Preface to Fables, Ancient and Modern. There is another one, A Parallel of Poetry and Painting. And we will discuss the most important of Dryden's critical works, that is Essay on Dramatic Poesy. Essay on Dramatic Poesy is a work which is actually presented in the form of conversation between four people. They are uh, the views and tastes of men and women of his time. That is what he actually discusses in Essay on Dramatic Poesy, which is the form of a semi-drama where these four characters, they engage in a debate, they engage in a conversation. Someone has uh, unmuted their audio. Could you please mute it? So these are the four characters that we see in Ezion Dramatic Poesy. They are engaged in the conversation. There is uh, Eugenius, who is Charles Sackbill, Dryden's patron. Then we have Wrights, that is uh, in actual um, Sir Robert Howard, Dryden's brother in law. There is Lysidius, that is the poet, politician, friend of Dryden. And Dryden himself appears in this work as the character Neatha. So when we look at uh, and see on dramatic poesy, there are many uh, debates going on. The first debate is with regard to the merit of Greeks and moderns. So the character writes, he prefers clunkel with three unities, whereas Eugenius, he is in favor of modern drama. And uh, the fault with Eugenius is that he criticizes classical playwrights instead of talking about the virtues of moderns. So that is the first debate that we see between Kreitz and Eugenius regarding the merits of Greek, Greek drama and modern drama. The second is between Lysidius and Neatha. Lysidius favors French drama because he says there is poetic justice, emotions, no violence. Truth is there. It, it is a combination of truth as well as fiction, French dramas, and they have only single plot. Whereas Neander that is Dryden, he favors Elizabethan drama. He considers Elizabethan drama or English drama superior to French drama. And he also talks about tragic comedy. 
the the subplots that are there in english drama french drama has only single plot and their unities are not followed in elizabethan drama there is change of place change of time and all these actually diminishes uh, the, the credibility in drama so the neander that is dryden he comes to us uh, elizabethan or the english drama superior to french drama that is how the conversation ends the third is third debate is with ricardo rhyme which is between crites and neander crites comes to blank verse as fitting the idiom because it is most suitable for drama and it is a form which is more close to prose so crites says blank verse is the best medium to be used in drama whereas neander considers rhyme because when any briefly and clearly everything could be explained with the help of rhyme so these are the uh the main debates that we see in essay on dramatic poesy now uh we'll discuss the other important um literary contributions by dryden uh you know dryden is known as the father of english criticism uh, this is said by dr johnson in his lives of english poets though dryden was a neoclassical critic he was a liberal classicist he didn't strictly follow all the rules by the classical writers and he was even ready to break all those conventions of the classical writers and uh dryden according to dryden poetry is an art of imitation and the very aim of poetry is to delight and instruction comes only secondary and in this verse to delight and to transport rather than instruct that is the aim of poetry and poet is a creator and dryden uh also justifies the use of tragic comedy according to dryden a scene of joy mixed with sadness refreshes the mind it is something which provides dramatic relief whereas the continuous gravity of a scene depresses the spirit and not just that life is a combination of joy and joys and sorrows so both elements should be there in a play so he justifies tragic comedy and he says that the english the elizabethan drama they have dramatized they have perfected a new way of writing which is not known to the ancients if they have tragic comedies perhaps aristotle would have revised his rules that is what dryden says had aristotle seen the tragic comedies he would have changed his mind so in short dryden justifies the violation of the three unities laid down by aristotle that is not needed and dryden also advocated comparative method comparative method is uh, similar to that of aristotle uh, i'm sorry matthew arnold's touchstone method or ts eliot's notion of tradition or something that we see in f r lewis his notion of culture and great tradition that is a peasant work has to be compared with the works of classical masters in order to test its quality the quality or the merit of a work should be judged by comparing the work to that of the works of the classical writers that is dryden's comparative method yeah i think uh, we have covered almost all the um areas of dryden now moving on to alexander pope and these are the important works of pope another neoclassical critic as the on criticism preface to shakespeare art of thinking epistle to augustus and his preface to the translation of the iliad so pope uh gave importance to reason and intellect he was not purely a classicist but he considered poetry of common sense as the best for man and like the classical masters imitation for him was to copy nature because to copy nature is to copy them then the classical masters so though he is a person who adhered to many of the classical rules we can see renaissance and romantic elements in his writings and pope actually has done or he examines the uh, important causes of literary 
misjudgment in his writings, especially in the work and his own criticism. The essay and his own criticism is a work which is a survey of criticism in general. But he also talks about the characteristics of a good critic. Who is a good critic, as well as the function of criticism, and we can all also see that uh, these two words, nature as well as wit, are two words which are frequently used by Pope in this particular essay. And according to him, uh, there are four functions of criticism. First thing, the critics must adhere to the rules laid down by the classical writers. They should imitate the rules established by the classical writers. Number two, how the critics have deviated from these rules. And number three, he talks about the characteristics of a good critic. Three characteristics according to Pop, humility, integrity, and courage are needed for a good critic. So uh, many are of the view that Pop didn't contribute much to English criticism, but still uh, this particular essay stands testimony to his contribution to English criticism, essay on criticism. Now moving on to the next writer, that is Samuel Johnson. And I also would like to mention um, a few, you know, terms that we, I mean, a few phrases that we are familiar with, which are there, which are actually from essay on criticism by Alexander Pope, like to our is human, to forgive divine, uh, fools rush in where angels fear to dread, a little learning is a dangerous thing. All these uh, epithets actually come from Dryden's, sorry, Pop's essay on critics. Now we move to Samuel Johnson, uh, known for the works, the dictionary, lives of English poets, the rambler, that was his uh, journal, and refers to Shakespeare. And Johnson was known as the great charm of literature. We'll focus more on the work Preface to Shakespeare. This is his first work in descriptive criticism. And uh, he was a very uh, courageous soul that he, in the work, questions Shakespeare's moral purposes. And these are the uh, eight aspects of Shakespeare that Dryden discusses in Preface to Shakespeare. Shakespeare as a poet of nature, Shakespeare's uh, defense of tragic comedy, style, defects, Attack on the Three Unities, Historical Background to Drama, and the Editorial Practice. These are uh, Johnson's views that we see in Preface to Shakespeare. The Another important work is Lives of English Poets. Lives of English Poets is uh, described as the richest, the most beautiful, and indeed, the most perfect production of Johnson's pen. But uh, when he was approached by the publishers to write this such a book, he made a request to them that he won't be writing anything about the medieval and Renaissance poets. And the publisher accepted that. And he totally omitted all the medieval and Renaissance poets. And this particular work focuses only on 52 lives, lives of 52 poets from Abraham Cowley. Thomas Gray, that is the 17th and 18th century poets. And the views expressed by uh, Johnson are very interesting, especially with regard to Milton. He considered uh, the, the diction of Milton, especially in Paradise Lost, as very harsh, and the rhymes uncertain and the numbers unpleasing. And he also had such an opinion regarding Lizardus that it is not to be considered as the effusion of real passion. The passion that we see in uh, Lysidus is insincere. It is fake. For passion runs not after remote illusions and obscure opinions. So he was not uh, having high opinion about the master uh, Milton, John Milton. And uh, he also, uh, you know, justified the use of tragic comedy. Because according to Johnson, tragedy is not always pleasing. And tragedy comedies are true to life because it has got all these elements of life like joy, sorrows, pain, happiness. So he justified the use of tragedy comedies. 
and also the violation of the free unities. Because uh, according to Dr. Johnson, only one unity is necessary, which is the unity of action. And, uh, you know, in drama, what is happening? There is a dramatic illusion which is being created. The audience are always conscious of the happenings in the play. So there is no need of unity of time and place because the audience are under this dramatic illusion. Yeah. And again, because of uh, this particular work, Life's English Poets, uh, Dr. Johnson is known as the father of biographical criticism. Uh, he was also known as the literary dictator of his age. Now we'll move to romantic criticism and the two uh, great critics of the romantic era, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. We're all familiar with the features of uh, the romantic age. Uh, first we'll look into the great uh, poet critic, William Wordsworth. And we all know that one particular critical work of William Wordsworth that is prefers to the lyrical ballads. Lyrical Ballads was a collection of poetry uh, that contained poems by Wordsworth and Coleridge. And later in the year 1800, he added a preface to it, which was again revised in the year 1802. Further, two more editions came of the preface to Lyrical Ballads. Another one in 1802, the third one in 1802, and the fourth one in 1805. So altogether, four editions of preface to the Lyrical Ballads they published. So, uh, the first edition contained the one in the one published in 1800 uh, contained his poetic principles. The second edition, the second revised edition, is the most important one because it has got Wordsworth's theory of poetic diction. And uh, the other, you know, aspects like definition of poetry, qualifications of a poet, various stages of poetry, um, Wordsworth's view on Meta, these are the other uh, ideas or the other uh, things that he discusses in uh, preface to lyrical ballads. And uh, remember, this particular work is known as the Manifesto of Romanticism. So keep that in your mind. And we're all familiar with what's the definition of poetry. Poetry as the spontaneous overflow. Uh, and he sees poetry as an art of imitation. Poetry is a man speaking to man. That is words with, uh, you know, view of poetry. It is a man speaking to man. So that the theme of poetry should be taken from rustic life. And he also considers poetry as superior to philosophy, history, science. But poetry should be written in rustic language. And uh, regarding the qualifications of poet. A poet, as I said, is a man speaking to men. And a poet writer, sorry, a poet writes not for his pleasure alone, but for the pleasure of his readers. So the primary function of poetry, according to Wordsworth, is to give pleasure. A poet differs from ordinary individual because of four factors. Number one, poet has great and more lively sensibility. Number two, poet has greater power of imagination. Number three, he has greater knowledge of human nature. And number four, great powers of communication. So due to these four factors, a poet is different from the ordinary people. Or oh, these are the four qualifications for poet according to Wordsmith. A person with more sensibility, imagination, knowledge of human nature, and great power of communication. And he also talks about the various stages of poetry. Uh, there are primarily six different stages of poetry. The first stage is observation, or we can call that as the perception stage. You perceive an object or a character or an incident, which uh, sets up powerful emotions in the mind of the poet. Just imagine Wordsworth, that particular perception of daffodils or his perception of the, uh, the solitary girl. That is the first part. For the first stage. Second, there is a recollection. Recollection or contemplation of these emotions in tranquility. That is the uh, definition also we are familiar with that. That is the second stage. A, a contemplation or a recollection of, of that particular scene. 
and it is in this particular second stage that memory plays a very important role. Number three, the interrogation of the memory by the poet. The poet questions or the poet analyzes his memory. And the last stage, the fourth stage, is the stage of composition. It is this particular stage where the poet composes the poem, the capacity to communicate his experience to his readers or to others that happens at this particular stage. So remember, there are four various stages of poetry according to Wordsmith. First is the observation or the perception. Second, recollection or contemplation. Third is the interrogation of memory. And fourth one is the stage of composition. Yeah. Um, and now let's look into Wordsworth's theory of poetic diction. Uh, again, there are four different uh, points, four different aspects to this poetic uh, theory of poetic diction by Wordsworth. First, he was very much against Godimus. He was very much against uh, the inane artificiality uh, that is there in poetry. Because according to Wordsworth, it is the real language of men that should be used in poetry without any element of artificiality in it. So use language without ornamentation. Use language without any oddities, without any causeness. The real language of men in a state of vivid sensation, that is the poetic diction that should be used in poetry. The language of poetry should be the language of common people. And the theme should be taken from rustic life. Yes. Now, uh, let's look into Wordsworth's view on the use of meter. He justifies the use of meter um, for the following reasons. First thing is, meter is an additional source of pleasure. It gives pleasure. When you use meter in poetry, it gives extra pleasure to the reader. Second is that it can give pleasure even without use of poetic diction. Even if there is a lack of poetic diction, with the help of meter, you can provide pleasure. Third, it has a restraining effect on both emotion and passion. Fourth, it imparts passion to the word and so increases the emotional intensity. So on these grounds, he, uh, you know, is in favor of the use of meta in poetry. So these are the important uh, ideas that we find in Preface to Lyrical Ballads by William Wordsworth. Now we'll move to the second dramatic critic that is Coleridge. And uh, the literary uh, or the critical contribution of Coleridge, his biography and literary published in the year 1817. The first title given to biography and literary was autobiography and literary that was later changed. And in this work, he is trying to establish the principles of writing rather than furnishing rules or how to pass judgments on what has been written by others. And according to Coleridge, there should be a very faithful adherence to the truth of nature. And in the work, he talks about three important uh, uh, ideas related to poetry, imagination, fancy, and organic unity. Of which imagination, according to Coleridge, has got an exemplatic power. Sorry, this exemplastic power is the power capable of unifying or building into one. So imagination has this Exemplastic power according to Coleridge. And he divides imagination into primary imagination and secondary imagination. Primary imagination is something which is common in everyone, and this is a involuntary act of the mind, something that happens unconsciously. Or we can say primary imagination is simply perception, perception of objects and things of nature. Whereas secondary imagination, uh, it is a continuous thing. It is the rare ability of creative artists in shaping and modifying power. And this uh, 
it is at this secondary imagination we find that exemplastic power, the power to unify and shape objects of nature into beautiful things, the power to organize emotions and feelings and give them shape. That happens with secondary imagination. And he differentiates imagination uh, and fancy. Fancy, according to Coleridge, has no creative power. Fancy is a deliberate act. It combines things, but it has no power to unify. And uh, he also talks about organic unity, uh, which is actually the perfect unity of form and content. Again, uh, rhyme, meter are also integral parts of poetry. And the pleasure that you, we get from poetry is something which is very, it's a special kind of pleasure. It is something uh, peculiar to poetry alone. And this pleasure which results both for the parts and the whole. And according to uh, Coleridge, uh, they should be uh, structure, design and unity in poetry. And uh, these two people, the romantic critics Coleridge and Wordsworth, uh, though they published works together, they had difference of opinion regarding uh, a few uh, aspects of poetry. First is regarding theme of poetry. According to Wordsworth, the theme of poetry should be taken from rustic characters, rustic life. But Coleridge prefers that, that not all characters of Wordsworth are from rustic. Uh, if we take forms like Ruth and Michael, they are not rustic characters. Uh, again, Coleridge objects Wordsworth's view that the best language is the one used by best characters. And they also differ uh, with regard to the use of rhyme and meter. Wordsworth uh, says that meter and rhyme are not essential, whereas for Coleridge, they are the integral parts of poetry, or they are very important to provide organic unity to a work. So this is all about the romantic uh, critics, along with fancy imagination and organic unity. Uh, I would also like to mention Another contribution of Wordsworth, which is the willing suspension of disbelief. Willing suspension of disbelief is a, uh, you know, a phrase coined by Wordsworth. I guess we are familiar with it, which is the uh, disbelief, okay, for that particular moment. A formula for justifying the use of fantastic or non-realistic elements in literature. That is willing suspension of disbelief according to Coleridge. And again, uh, if we look at the writings or the themes of Wordsworth and Coleridge, there is a one saying which I remember that Wordsworth makes natural look supernatural, whereas Coleridge makes supernatural uh, look natural. So both of them, they used different various themes, uh, but they have made it, uh, you know, elementary uh, too much. And since we're discussing the romantic critics, um, I think we should also mention these two romantic writers, Keats, who coined the term negative capability, uh, which has some connection with Coleridge's willing suspension of disbelief. Negative capability, we know what is it? The ability to get lost in a reverie, to lead the conscious life that is negative capability. Uh, also, Shelley's defense of poetry, uh, which could be seen as his critical work, which uh, he wrote as a reply to Thomas Love Peacock's The Four Ages of Poetry. And Shelley, in this particular work, he defends poetry and, uh, sorry, he defends poetry and talks about the uh, usefulness of poetry in the age of progress. So just keep in your mind the contributions made by Keats as well as Shelley also. Uh, while discussing traumatic criticism. Now moving on to Victorian criticism. Um, primarily, we have only one major critic, that is Matthew Arnold. But along with Matthew Arnold, we will also discuss the other writer, that is Walter Pater. So, um, we are all uh, family with the, the social and historical happenings of Victorian age, uh, Industrial Revolution, Publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, uh, how the reading public, university education, all these things came up during the Victorian age. And the most important critic of the time, Matthew Arnold. These are some of the important works by Matthew Arnold. 
literature and dogma, culture and anarchy, essays and criticism, three series, 1865, 1888, and 1910, on translating Homer and preface to his poems of 1853. Uh, I think categories is not there. I forgot to delete that, but uh, that is not Arnold's work, categories. And um, Arnold gives his definition of poetry, his ideas on how to judge a work on true high seriousness, what are the qualifications with the critic, and also uh, Touchstone Method. We find all these in the essay, Study of Poetry, written by Matthew Arnold. So, uh, and let's look into each of uh, these ideas of Matthew Arnold. And remember, Matthew Arnold was uh, born as a propagandist missionary. Uh, this is how he defines poetry. According to him, poetry is at bottom a criticism of life. It is an application of ideas to life. And uh, he also believes that best poetry embodies poetic truth, poetic beauty, which according to Matthew Arnold are the essence of poetry. And best poetry should contain uh, elements of Hellenism. It should be plain, prosaic. And uh, for him, the great poets are the earlier poets like Dante, Milton, uh, the Roman Homer, Sophocles. And from the English poets, he considers only Wordsworth and from French Gepe as great writers. And uh, there are reasons for, for Arnold to consider these people as great writers and certain other great writers like Chaucer, uh, Dryden, Pop, and Shelley as not great writers. The reason is high seriousness. High seriousness is a, uh, a term introduced by Matthew Arnold. He doesn't give a very clear cut definition of what is this high seriousness, but it is an extreme level of seriousness that should be there in the work. And Chaucer is not a great poet according to Matthew Arnold because he lacks high seriousness. Not just Chaucer, even great writers like Dryden, Pop, Shelley, they are not great according to him because they lack high seriousness. So this, you know, two aspects, high seriousness and truth. These, according to Matthew Arnold, they give superior character to any work of art. And he also believes that the very aim of poetry is to instruct. Poetry has to make men nobler, better. But at the same time, he is very much against didactic poetry. And uh, while uh, discussing the, uh, you know, how estimate of a work, he talks about three kinds of estimates. Historic estimate, personal estimate, and real estimate. Historic estimate, we know, by comparing a work with the works or the parts of history, that is, historical estimate. Personal is when you judge a work according to personal interest. All these, according to Matthew Arnold, are dangerous. And the only... Uh, you know, real estimate is uh, the perfect way to judge a work. And real estimate should have the superior character of truth as well as high seriousness in it. So remember these two terms, uh, truth and high seriousness with regard to Matthew Arnold. And uh, another important uh, contribution of Matthew Arnold is the touch stone method. Uh, again, another method... Uh, to identify the greatness of a work. While discussing Dryden, we talked about the comparative method. Similarly, uh, Matthew Arnold uh, talks about two different tools, comparison and analysis. Comparison and analysis are two tools to identify the greatness of a work. That is, a present work has to be compared with the lines and selected passages of the works of the great writers. By great writers, he meant the uh, only writers like Virgil, Homer, Dante, or even Milton. And truth and high seriousness, according to Matthew Arnold, make these works great. He considers Thomas Gray as a great poet because Thomas Gray's poems contain truth as well as high seriousness. But uh, this particular Tubstone method is not uh, an original method by Arnold. As I said, uh, Dryden has already uh, explained comparative method in preface to fables. Data also, in the 20th century, we find similar kinds of methods employed by 
critics like T.S. Eliot uh, and F.R. Leavis. Uh, now we'll move to the qualifications of a critic. Um, there are four um, important qualifications according to Matthew Arnold for a critic. Number one, the curiosity and desire to know. That should be there in a critic. Curiosity and desire to know. Number two is disinterestedness. Number three, objectivity. And number four, sincerity. So these are the four important qualifications of a critic according to Matthew Arnold. Curiosity and desire to know, disinterestedness, objectivity and sincerity. And criticism according to uh, Matthew Arnold is to be directed not only upon life in general, but also upon the work of art. In his words, it is a business of criticism to know the best that is known and thought in the world. It is the business of criticism to know the best that is known and thought in the world. Criticism, according to Arnold, has the power to make the best ideas prevail. Uh, yeah, I think that's all about Matthew Arnold. And also there is the other work, Culture and Anarchy, uh, Literature and Dogma, where he introduces various other aspects related to culture and anarchy other than literature. Since we are running short of time, I'm not going to delve deep into the other works. Uh, we'll deal with the last of uh, the critics and we'll wind up. Um, that is Sir Walter Peter. Walter Peter is a person who was um, known for art for art's sake. And he has written two works, Mary is the Epicurean, and the other one is um, Studies in the History of Renaissance, Plato, and, and Art. And um, he was a person, uh, a point critic who was a lover of beauty. And according to him, art has no social obligation. It shouldn't have any kind of moral or didactic purpose. And um, he belonged to the school of aestheticism. Where the importance was given to uh, lyrics, importance was given to the aesthetic enjoyment. And this aesthetic enjoyment of your work was seen as the ultimate enjoyment by the school of aestheticism. Uh, where we find the art for art's sake. Okay. So, um, I think uh, we have covered almost all the important critics up to uh, Victorian age. Now we have three more critics um, in the 20th century left wing criticism. Uh, mostly will be uh, dealt in tomorrow session, I guess. Um, so with this, I think we'll wind up the session. Um, I don't know what the things were that clear to you because that was a kind of roller coaster ride for me. I had to complete all these writers from classical criticism up to Victorian age in one hour. So, um, yeah. I guess you got at least a fair knowledge regarding literary criticism and the important concepts of these critics. Hello? Ma'am, the response is, shows it, actually. You did a wonderful job and uh, we got it from the scratch. Actually, it was very clear. And uh, we are so glad to have you as uh, our RP, actually. Uh, you can collect uh, all the responses from the students uh, from the screen itself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... If you have any further doubts, I'm ready to clarify that. Uh, not now, actually, because I need to rush. I have a function to write right now. As you own file, uh, send it to me. Fair close to organizers. I uh, could get my brief ID and contact me if you can get any further back. Sure, sure, ma'am. Anybody, if you are having any, all the for all the candidates I'm saying, if you are having any doubts or uh, need any clarifications, you can message us. No issues in that. I know you are having that numbers from where you got our uh, details and uh, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, you, do you have anything more to say? Well, uh, thank you, thank you so much. I thank the organizers as well as all the, uh, you know, participants who are here. Thank you, thank you so much. But the organizing principles.
Thank you. Yeah, we are so glad, ma'am, actually. Yeah, you can uh, I've shared my PowerPoint with the organizers. Uh think it is better. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh everyone.